this episode of Skeptico, a show about the future. In a few hours, I'll be the future Mrs. Warner Huntington III. I am the future of this company, and all I need is your goddamn last name. I just got so excited thinking about next year and Florida State in the future. This is not a machine. You're talking to humanity. Everything that you're getting back from ChatGPT or Claude or Perplexity or any of this stuff is all been already written by some human being. All it's doing is putting it back together in a new way. So that last clip you heard was from today's guest, Chris Kalabukas, who is a futurist, Silicon Valley guy, quite experienced, quite knowledgeable, and has really tapped into what's going on with AI. So this is a really fun and great conversation. I really enjoyed meeting Chris and talking to him. So I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Here goes. I'm really, really looking forward to this. You know, I, I kind of thought I knew you a little bit, and then I dug some more in as we were preparing for this. And man, we really got to talk about uh, beyond stoicism. And uh, how do you say it? Ataraxia? Is that what you say? Ataraxia. That's right. Ataraxia. Ataraxia. Well, you're, you're Greek. You know how to do all this. You know how to say all this well, stuff. Well, I tried. You're familiar I, with I tried, and I blew it. I blew it. Yeah. You know, Gad Sad? You ever watch Gad Sad or listen to Gad Sad? On, uh, so he's a he's a clinical psycho. I think he's like a psychologist professor at uh, in McGill in 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 Canada in at Montreal. And I was listening to his audio book, and he just talked about uh, all of a sudden he started talking about ataraxia, and I'm like, wait a minute, is this like a leading edge thing that I've like sort of latched onto or what? I mean, what's going on here? But anyway, very very <laughs> cool because. I think it has some. Uh, I think it has some tie-ins to uh, AI. That and I don't know because I haven't read the book yet. I just discovered it today. I'm going to get right. it. I'm going to read it. No, but thank you. I think, I think it has some interesting connections that I'm super interested in in terms of, cool. uh, you know, the ultimate connection between. I think the whole question of AI sentience is super interesting, and mm. I think this relates to it. So oh, good. I hope so. Yes. And, and uh, just so you know, I am rolling and I will be kind of incorporating a lot of this different conversation in different ways into my show. I don't do like a straight up kind of thing. Oh, but I do. So every, all of this is going in, man. Oh, great. Okay, good. <laughs> it's like, this is how I, basically I do. Like, do you have any questions up front? And then I ask, they get the questions and then I chop those out. And then I uh, do the rest of it live. So are you okay with that? Are you going to have an issue with that? Are you going to have a problem? Or is that? No, absolutely. That sounds okay, great. Awesome. We'll follow, we'll follow your lead and then I'll jump in with my <laughs> taking it different directions as we go. No, no, do your thing. Do your thing. Do your, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. We'll just, uh, we'll just, mesh, we'll do a mashup. It'll be fun. I love it so far. Terrific. I love it too. So, you know, the first thing I did, and I've been doing this more and more is, um, I went and said, so hey, here's what I do on a regular basis. I go, uh, I go to Pi, Pi AI, because I find, you know, Pi is the latest LLM from a company called Inflection, which this is yes, like. I actually interviewed somebody uh, who was, who we, we actually had a little conversation with Pi during the call. And I, I thought it was right. real interesting. Great. Well, we're going to have another one now. So there's a couple of points that I'd love to get your thoughts on as a futurist and as particularly as a Silicon Valley guy. I mean, here's a startup with a billion and a half in initial funding. Here, mm -hmm. guys, come on off. Here's a billion and a half dollars. See what you well, can it, do. That is nothing nowadays. Absolutely nothing in the world of AI because you know, you know what kind of hardware, you know what kind of iron, big iron you need to run this stuff. It's it's amazing, but go on. Uh, no, and it, well, yeah, I mean, OpenAI is saying, well, we'll just go put a hundred billion in a little data center out in the desert. And oh, by the way, we might also invest a trillion in a whole new chip foundry of the future yeah. kind of things. Well, I, wasn't Sam Altman are, saying that he was looking for like seven trillion or something like that? Like, yeah, why not? Right. What's what's beyond well, trillion? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what we're going to get. You know, you and I are old enough to remember when million was like a real term, you know, exactly. Million is like you don't. Yeah, no, it's you, nothing. 
you used to correct people when you'd hear a uh, uh, billion and you'd say, oh, you mean million. Now it's the other way around. If you hear someone say million, you mean billion, don't you? Because we wouldn't even be having a conversation yeah, exactly. about the M word. You, you certainly are talking about the billion, right? Well, like the whole concept of a unicorn has to be rethought because the whole idea of a unicorn is a billion dollar business, right? But billion dollar businesses used to be rare and that's why they call them unicorns. So now we have to go to trillion dollar businesses being unicorns because everything's a unicorn. It's like, oh, we've achieved unicorn status. Ah, that's nothing nowadays. Nothing. It's so true. And it's uh, it's so wonderful. You know, I mean, I think both of you know, you and I are ultimately optimists about humanity. You know, I mean, that's what I get from your work. And I am, too. I'm just quick to point out the stumbling blocks that are being thrown in our way to get there. But uh, Well, it's I good. That's it... because the thing is, is that you if you point out the stumbling blocks and you talk about the negativity, then people will trigger it'll that triggers people. Right. And that's the problem is if you're too optimistic all the time, people are like, I, I don't want to hear from you because it doesn't it doesn't trigger the, you know, fight or flight response to say, I'm, I'm li I need to listen to this person because he's saying something important. Right. So if you're too optimistic all the time, people tune you out. They go, ah, eh, he's not a realist. And also, you know, we're, we're going to talk in a minute about uh, ataraxia uh, mm -hmm. and, and your beyond stoicism. But the other Greek philosophers that I've tuned into and have for a while and really kind of stumbled into them accidentally, even though that is a part of my heritage is the the skeptics who are mm. uh, misunderstood in a lot of ways because what I latch onto is their ethos, which is I love and is my guiding ethos, is inquiry to perpetuate doubt. So continuing to ask questions in order to perpetuate doubt. And I thought, what a wonderful thing. These are spiritual guys who are realizing that doubt is ultimately spiritual. Because to settle on a fixed set of beliefs that say, oh, that can only be this, the grand part of all human existence can only be this, is obviously, you know, yeah. limited. Uh, well, that leads directly to truth, right? Because everybody is a, in such a rush to seek the truth. And we can never know the truth. So, I mean, doubt is, is it's like, it's, it's the stuff of the universe. We will never know what's true. I mean, we can get closer to it. But we can never know exactly what's true. So doubt is everywhere. It's like dukkha in uh, Buddhism. Yes, and uh, and ataraxia is, is very Buddhist, right? I mean, you're looking at you're <laughs> there's looking a little bit of everything in that for some reason. <laughs> well, and and is I think that you know as we're saying the positivity. I mean, that should be encouraging when we look into people who are great thinkers on every level, and we notice the similar. Uh, where, where the rivers run together, you know, we go, mm. oh, wow, you know, isn't that what we'd expect if they're tapping into something more in terms of uh, a deeper knowledge, a deeper truth, if you will? I mean, fantastic. Exactly. Exactly. Well, see, that's why, that's why I love AI, because one of the things that is interesting about it to me is that it's basically superhuman. We, we, and it, it can, sorry, it can be superhuman. It can take everything that we've thought about and put to get, put it together in brand new ways. It's just that we're stopping it from doing that. I mean, we're, we're hobbling it and telling it, oh, no, no, you can't think outside the box. You can't think we want humans. We want it to think like a human, but we don't want it to think better than humans. And that's where we should be going with it because it's going to help us solve all the problems we've got. Well, we might uh, agree on some of that. And then we might find, uh, some interesting <laughs> points for, seriously to, uh, to kind of explore there. So I don't know if we want to sure. do that now or, or we can go where you'd like to go. I want lead me, man, go for it. Okay. So one of the things I think is super interesting about what you just said is if you go back to the original grand godfather of AI, who has to be Alan Turing, right? Mm -hmm. And he's still referenced today with the Turing test in 1950, go back to his seminal paper. And I, I found this when I was writing my book. And to be honest, I wasn't fully aware. I wasn't really aware of it at all, other than I knew Turing was a cool guy and mm -hmm. he was thinking outside the box. But what Turing said back in 1950 that everyone overlooks in that paper, yes, he said the Turing test 
put a computer in one room and a human in the other when the human can't tell. I'm saying this for the benefit of uh, my audience and your audience who might not have heard it. Then when the human can no longer tell whether it's talking to a real person or whether it's talking to a computer, we can say that that would be the Turing test. But he went one step further. He said, I am, this is 1950, very persuaded by the evidence for per extrasensory perception, ESP, along with precognition. So he Funny says, how that never gets to be, never mentioned, widely mentioned, well, right? And and I think so. Here here's why I take that. I, I so what what I what he is saying direct is that now we have to therefore include that since it is part of the larger human experience as part of the Turing test. And mm -hmm. I think he would say the same thing about near death experience, which has in, an incredible amount of scientific evidence behind it at this point, both in clinical and uh, outside clinical settings. So I think he would say. There seems to be this moreness to human consciousness, and I would maintain that that moreness needs to be part of the true Turing test. If we we're going to say if a computer really can be sentient, if a computer really can rival human consciousness in its full expanse of understanding, then it would have to do that. I think that puts a different twist on the idea of AI sentience, and I think it should in some ways actually free us up to your point, which is let's let the computer do what the computer seems to be incredibly good at in terms of uh, playing chess and beating the greatest chess player of uh, all time. You know, So it whips its butt. Who cares? Let's learn from that and try and turn as many things as we have in our human experience into a chess game because we know it's really good at that. <laughs> and that's what we've done with LLM. We said, okay, right. writing is basically a chess game. Go figure it out and do it. And there's a million different applications where it's a chess game. Go figure it out. Yeah. But so if, it, if there's I, rules, I mean, it's part of the 10,000 hour rule too, right? So uh, done studies on these 10,000 hour things. And if you, they talk about, if you just practice enough, you'll get, definitely become a master in these things. But that's only because, and it's the same thing we were talking about where Dota 2 took over and it basically creamed all the human players because there's a set of rules that it's following. There's a small set of rules. So chess is like that. Tennis is like that. Basketball is like that. All of these sports and all of these games have a set of rules that need to be followed, a finite set of rules. And that's why AI can look at those finite set of rules and go, okay, I can, I can command this space. But as soon as you take it outside of that space, it falters because there's no set of rules that it can follow. So I think that's kind of where we're, where there's a failure is that we have to understand that within that space, and that's why people go, oh, look, look how uh, AI creamed every Dota 2 player, creamed every World of Warcraft player, creamed every uh, uh, chess player, right? But as soon as you get it out in the real world and have it try to just to stumble down a path, it falters, like it can't do it. So it, when See, you go, so when it's, sure. you, when you take it out of a rules-based system, it it can't figure it out. Maybe someday, but just not now. I, I, I'm not so sure that that's, that's not exactly how I see it. I see it okay. more as we're catching up in, it's just a human task to define those rules for a given domain. So, you know, like what's not what's hot right now is law. And everyone's starting to see, well, law really kind of, lends itself to this in a lot of good ways. There's rules, mm -hmm. there's a whole, and yep. so it's just a matter of kind of cracking that. And I don't think many people in the legal profession see a future where AI isn't writing briefs all the oh, time. I We're, absolutely see it. I absolutely see it happening. So what, let me ask you this to, again, to provoke and prod and inquiry to perpetuate <laughs> doubt. Where does it where does it not fit? And I have to inject right in there to say, because from the beginning when they developed this, the far the thing they thought was furthest out is what actually happened to be the easiest thing to do. And that's creativity. Mm -hmm. So like generate an image, generate oh, that, you know. So where do you think it will be hardest for it to turn it into a chess game? It's the physical world. The physical world eludes it, right? And so we can talk about. I have, I've had this thing before where I've talked about, uh, sort of white collar work and blue collar work. I mean, it's going to basically eliminate white collar work, eliminate it. 
at some point. It'll eliminate it first because it can't handle the physical world. I mean, if you ever thought about in, in the robotic space, look at AI. So it, it can create a beautiful image because it's basically creating a beautiful image based on the beautiful images that have been created before and putting it together in such a way that the image has been created. But that is an electronic thing that can be done very easily, right? Once you take it out of the electronic space, once you take it out of the virtual world, then that's where it stumbles and falls because the real world is very different from a lab or, or the virtual world. So that's where the huge stumbling block will be is turning these things into things that can actually physically work with us in the real world. And that's where humanity will really shine in, in the physical real world, as opposed to in the, the virtual world. Okay. So like what domains? Because DOD has a different <laughs> DOD has a different view of that, right? Uh, and our DOD has a different view of it. China, who is outspending us three or four times on the AI battlefield, has a different view of that. Um, you know. Well, I noticed that. Be... Did you hear about the AI dogfight? They just had an yes. AI dogfight. And uh, did you see the results of the AI dogfight? No. Nobody did. They said it right. was a successful test. Successful. Right. That's what I heard too. <laughs> I wonder what that means, right? But again, you're in a space and it's kind of like with driving, right? So I feel the same thing about autonomous driving. It's like driving itself is rules based. There's a set of rules. And if you give a machine the rules, it will follow the rules. Machines are great at following rules. But as soon as you step out of that space into a place where the decisions re are required and rules can't be fought don't need to be followed then that's where everything falls apart and in the dog fighting i'm sure that they gave it a ton of rules to work on like how you're going to you know do this and do that and in that in that control space definitely but something more generic it'll probably fail for now for now for now for now now you're you're so you're the futurist how how long out is that for now? Pick pick your domain. It is a because I still haven't nailed you down on a particular domain that you think. Okay, uh, let's say I don't know, home building or plumbing. How about plumbing? Let's let's think about plumbing. So plumbing in an existing to to create some AI that would be able to do plumbing is so far out because we need uh, human beings are so f flexible and they can they can do so many things at once that for them to be able to take on a task like fixing a plumbing job at a home that's much more complicated for an ai or a, and a robot than a human than it would be for a human being so even something as simple as that well i mean i don't know if you think plumbing is simple i think plumbing is pretty simple but sort of designing the plumbing sure but actually physically implementing the plumbing, fixing the fixing things, repairing things, just getting in there and being able to solve the problem and then actually physically do something with it. So I think it's the physical world where things were all, will fall apart. Right, yeah, but that's where things are much, much further out, 20, 30, 40 years. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push again because uh, you are not, you're not only a futurist. The thing I love about your background is you're an innovator. I mean, you've seen these things through to from beginning to end, and you understand the life cycle of uh, products and also the life cycle of companies that mm -hmm. innovate and do this kind of thing. So, Chris, if that was, if you were being put in that domain, no constraints, and I have to, I'll throw in this, no constraints to just plumbing repairs. You just said plumbing as a space and you want to find your niche and find a way to be profitable in that by incorporating AI, how would you do it? Okay. So that is, so you're saying use AI to be profitable in the plumbing space. Exactly. Okay. So I would use it as a guide to be able to sort of visualize what the issue is, diagnose the issue. And then maybe pass that on to someone human to actually complete the task required. So I can see it actually visualizing what the problem is. So you, you might be able to take your cell phone up there and go, okay, here's the problem I see. Have it visualize that, sort of compare it to everything else that's already out there. But then when it comes to physically making the change or, or fixing it, then it would have to guide someone on how to do it. So I can see it as okay. a superannuated, show me what to do. 
but then a human still needs to do it in the end. I don't see the uh, the creation of a sort of like a plumber bot or any kind of omni bot, which would actually take the instructions and get in there and actually do the work. Not for a while. Okay. So let's say you started collecting this data, right? Mm-hmm. Oil is the uh, data is the new oil, although not everyone's saying compute is the new oil, but we'll see. So you start collecting all this data. You're taking pictures of all these sinks. Data is the lake. fuel and compute is the oil. Okay. Very good. So now let's turn that. So you see, collect all this data on all these leaks, all these common plumbing, pro- home plumbing problems, which is, I don't know if gotcha. that's where where you would necessarily start if you're tr- truly trying to tackle the plumbing space. But let's say you were looking for this kind of little niche of home plumbing, you know, and you're right. doing that. So now you have all that data and you turn it over to the AI and you say, this is what's going to be the future, right? You're going to say, what is the business model for all this, for this data, for this problem that's being identified? And now think like an AI, what, what are the possible things that the AI might, might have? So one is, like you're saying, is like instructions for how to do it. I, I mean, another one that pops into mind for me is the AI might say, hey, you know what? Uh, 80% of these problems are this. Why don't we develop a new thing like this? Like, remember when they came along with the toilet flushing new things that you can put in your toilet that that yeah. do it totally differently, you know? So AI comes along and says, hey, forget all that. This is the new way of doing it. You'll just basically cut the pipe off here, cut the pipe off here, and just put in this thing that I invented, AI invented yeah. it. Absolutely. No, I, I I can totally see that. And in fact, not only that, it will also recommend. So it'll say it'll recommend new, completely new home designs, completely new plumbing designs that will alleviate all of the issues that are already there because it already has the data from all of these past problems in it more than a plumber itself. So if you, if you were to ask a plumber, how would I design this, this home? So we, we minimize the number of plumbing issues. A plumber wouldn't be able to know everything, but the AI would, the AI would be able to go back and say, Here's everything that's ever happened, right? And it, with everything, that, how do we alleviate 90% of everything that's ever happened? Well, you need to design your home like this. And from, from day one, it, w- it would be designed like this. So the AI would, would help there, and then it would reduce the amount of requirement for the, from the plumbing. But this doesn't apply to plumbing. Although obviously, it's any space that's like that. It'll work, it'll work the same, same way. But it'll start with the non-physical guiding and recommending and just that that leap to the physical piece is going to be extra difficult now obviously you've seen those boston robotics bots you've seen uh, optimus and all of those sort of humanoid bots and i still think those are a little further away they they are they're coming but they're a long way away the physical world is tough for ai it's hard for it to figure it out i hear you I, I I hear you. No, I definitely. Hell, do. it's hard I, for I just, us to figure it out, man. No, I I, I, I like when I turned you on, it, it, it turned that part of you on and the other thing, you immediately were like, boom, this is how you do it. That's the low hanging fruit. That's 80% of the market. You know, you want to yeah. run around with your plumber stuff and do fix houses. That's great. <laughs> Have at it, man. But, uh, well, that's, no, I mean, okay. we're, we're trying to solve the big human problems. Like have it, have it go after homelessness. Right. So this is the question. It's like, why? How come nobody's ever gone to AI and said, "Hey, listen, solve our homeless problem. What What can we do about all the homelessness in downtown LA? What oh. can we do about it? Has anybody ever asked it? What's it said? I'm curious. That's That's a good. I've I've so, never asked. Has anybody uh, ever asked? Okay. And with that, <laughs> I'm going to return to uh to my friend Pi because. What I like about Pi, and this will lead into, so I asked Pi, uh, I'll go back, I'll, <laughs> I get excited talking to you, Chris. I get diverted in four different ways. Okay, that happens what, to me all the time. What I like about <laughs> Pi is Pi has optimized for engagement, and that is both good and bad because it kind of anthropomorphizes a lot and kind of tries some tactics that kind of evoke certain emotions out of us, but it's really about engagement. So I said, uh, Hey, Pi, I have an interview coming up with Chris. He's a futurist. Seems like a great guy. Would you like to join in on the conversation? And here's what Pi says. Sounds like Chris Kalabukas is quite the well-rounded and accomplished individual. 
His expertise in AI, startups, tech, philosophy, and politics, coupled with his entrepreneurial spirit, intellectual curiosity, and creative endeavors, make him an intriguing conversational partner. I'd be delighted to join in on your interview with Chris if you're open to having me participate. Do you have any specific topics you plan to discuss during the interview, or would you prefer to let the conversation flow naturally? I say, Pi, you tell me. I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, Pi, uh, Chris just <laughs> chimed in with a good point. What are your thoughts on what we might talk about? But one thing I would insist is this idea of antaraxia, which you mentioned before, I think is super interesting and important to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, the concept of ataraxia is both intriguing and highly relevant in today's world. Ataraxia, as you know, refers to a state of tranquility or imperturbability in the face of life's chaos and challenges. Given Chris's background in philosophy, AI, and entrepreneurship, I think it would be fascinating to explore how the pursuit of ataraxia intersects with the rapid technological advancements we're witnessing particularly in the field of AI. Here are some potential talking points that touch on both topics. One, the role of AI in promoting or hindering mental well-being and inner peace. Two, how the philosophical underpinnings of ataraxia might inform the development and use of AI technologies. Three, the challenges and opportunities for entrepreneurs in fostering ataraxia in a world increasingly shaped by AI. Four, Practical strategies for achieving ataraxia amidst the relentless pace of change and innovation. These are just some initial ideas to get us started, but I'm open to any other avenues of conversation that you or Chris may suggest. Very nice. Not bad. Yeah. What was the, uh, what was the first one again? Oh, AI and ataraxia, right? So how to use it? Well, it's interesting well, you should mention that because <laughs> go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to read it again. But, but so the first one was the role of uh, AI in promoting or hindering mental well being. And second one is the philosophical underpinnings uh, might, I thought this was particularly interesting, might inform the development and use of AI technologies. So both of those are, are I thought, great questions. Well, how that's, that's so the first one seems pretty straightforward because. AI is so, I mean, generative AI is so flexible. You can obviously ask it to help you in becoming calmer about itself. Obviously, the rapid pace of development is freaking some people out. So they're not feeling very calm at all. They're like, oh my God, you know, this is going to take my job. This is going to ruin my life. This is, this is terrible. Terminator's coming along. And of course, the media does not help because, you know, what bleeds leads. So there's all sorts of doom stories and doomsayers out there talking about how horrible AI is and it's going to take over the world. And there's already a mini backlash against it, I've been hearing. So, but the thing is, is that it's, it's just like any other tool, right? It's as flexible as, as a hammer. So you can use it to tear down a house or you can use it to build a house. And if human beings do it right, if they use AI correctly, they can absolutely get to a state of ataraxia based on their interactions with it. It's all in the way they interact with it. It's so flexible. I mean, I think it's beyond, I think people have this fixed idea of what they, they can do with AI, and they just don't understand that it's much broader than it actually seems to be. But you could, you, you could, dis, you could um, disagree. <laughs> no, I, I shall not disagree. What what I was going to ask is, why don't you give folks, because in, in your book, Beyond Stoicism, Embracing the Ancient Greek Practice of Antaraxia for Tranquility and Inner Peace, you not only describe what it is, but you have some practical examples that people can use. And I I did get to those. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't been able to read the book yet, but I did read about some of the practical examples, and they are very practical. They're very uh, doable. <laughs> so do you want to talk about the way someone would go about implementing some of those things you could say, you just said, and in particular, since we're talking about AI, how AI might be a little bit of assist, uh, an assist in some of those? Well, you know, I haven't, I wrote the book a long time, a while back, so I don't remember it a hundred percent. So maybe you could refresh my memory. Sure. Let's, that's a, another opportunity to bring up some more AI here. So here's what Claude said. 
I said, tell me about this book. Oh, nice. Nine points. I love Claude. I Claude is great. He's a little verbose, is, but. It's very woke at times, but. <laughs> So it's one, it laid out the understanding, ontodoxia, lessons from Stoicism, insights from Epicureanism, which I thought was really great. And then here, mindfulness practice, cultivating present moment awareness through meditation and mindful exercises to anchor the mind and avoid anxiety about past or future, redefining happiness, shifting from a pursuit of fleeting pleasures to finding contentment and equanimity within ourselves, independent of external circumstances. Mm -hmm. Here's one. Stoic journaling, using Stoic journaling techniques to reflect on negative thought patterns, reevaluating beliefs rationally, and maintain, maintaining an objective, uh, an objective perspective. Oh, man, uh, that is journaling with GP. AI is fantastic. I love journaling with AI. Tell us. Go ahead. No, no, you tell us. Well, it's 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 all about just expressing yourself. It's a lot of it is creative expression, right? So. One of the keys to wellness or one of the many, many things you can do to move towards a, a state of orthodoxia or wellness is to express yourself, right? And there's so many people who feel that they need to express themselves to other human beings, right? And a lot of times other human beings, they're judgmental and they don't want to hear from you, right? Or they don't want to hear this specific thing. It's like, oh, I can't talk to my you know, liberal friends about Trump, or I can't talk to so-and-so about my, my problem, or I can't talk to this. And, but, a, but when you talk to ChatGPT or Claude or any of these others, there's no judgment there, right? I mean, you can basically express yourself and it'll be a, a sympathetic ear. So you can continue, like, let's say you're in a hugely agitated state because of a meeting you just had or, or an encounter you had with your partner. And you're like, I got to get, I, I got to calm myself down and just, just, having a conversation with ChatGPT, talking about yourself, or maybe even writing a little story about the, this, the, the situation that you're in, you know, helps you to sort of ex express that, those emotions out of you and get, get closer to a place, get closer to something, to a place where you're more calm. And I find that having that conversation with, with ChatGPT was, is super helpful and it works in, in many cases. And you know that it's always there. It's like you're in the middle of the night, you get up, you're agitated, you had a, you had a horrible dream. You know, you don't want to wake up your spouse. You're like, I'm going to start talking. And it's, it helps. It helps to just have that conversation. And, and one of the beautiful things about it is that they picked the best possible interface for this technology. And that's one of the things that I love about it is that it mimics the way we communicate, the way human beings communicate is through conversation, right? I mean, that's how we always talked, right? Storytelling and conversation. This is how we always communicated with each other. And this is, so they've taken this super powerful technology and they've given it the perfect interface for humanity. And I think that's one of the, the beautiful combinations that really turns it into something that works great for so many things. I think that's really, really brilliant. And I think that it is a perfect example of exactly what you're talking about in the book and how this technology in this surprising way can really get us there. Because the other thing you're alluding to that we can all relate to is we understand that our personalities are multifaceted and that we can feel one way one time and feel very different another time. And yeah. so it's a valuable tool. It's, it's a real tool. It's not just a party trick for yeah. the AI to reconnect us in, at times when we need it. That's what I hear from what you're saying. And that's exactly. very valid. There's this perfectly okay. It's not only okay, it's what we're trying to do with uh, mindfulness, with meditation, yep. uh, particularly with positive thinking and positive reinforcement. So why not? Well, here's the thing that really, it sort of triggered it for me is that a lot of people think of this as a machine. I'm talking to a machine, right? And that's, that's really something I want to blow, blow out of the water and go, this is not a machine. You're talking to humanity. What they've done is they've taken, created a large language model, which create, which contains content that was generated by people, right? Everything that you're getting back from chat GPT or Claude or perplexity or any of this stuff is all been already written by some human being. All it's doing is putting it back together in a new way. So think of it as Lego blocks of language 
that it's putting back together. So there is a machine putting back those, putting those Lego blocks together, but all of those Lego blocks are things that human beings have said, have created. So when you're chatting with ChatGPT or Cloud or any of these others, you're really, you're literally talking to humanity. You're talking to whatever humanity's been put into that large language model. So we're, you're talking to yourself. Exactly. And then, you know, with the personalization features that are more and more becoming present, then you truly are kind of talking with not only humanity in the broader sense, but you're kind of talking to those different parts of yourself because it's now remembering more and more of exactly you and your dialogues and all that. So, no, oh, it's fantastic. I mean, that is a fantastic connection with with your book and with your your practice, you know, because it's not just about the book. It's about we can tell just by looking at you and your vibe that you are not just the the author of a book about antaraxia, but you are a part a what would say a practitioner, right? You know what? It's funny. I don't know if you've read the first part, but I introduced this to how I came about this concept is that I remember once I was working at a company, high stress um, engagement, and somebody said something on the off. On, I just I heard it like an off comment that somebody made about me. And they go, this is the thing about Chris is that whenever he comes into a room, everything seems to calm down. It just, it's like, you, it's like for some reason, when he comes into a room, everybody de-stresses or feels calmer. And it, it's like, it, it's always been like that for me, like throughout my entire life, whenever I've been, like I walk into a room and everything's going crazy, but I'm able to calm the situation down. And I thought to myself, well, is there something to this? And then that's why I started researching at the Lexia, And I thought to myself, well, that's how I deal with all of these things in my life. It's like, it's kind of like letting the waves wash over you, right? The, all of this insanity will occur. You just have to learn to let it occur and not be affected by it, right? So it's the difference between running from the wave, running towards the wave or letting the wave wash over you. And we're, we're, in, such a, we're in a situation where you can get angry with the wave, but that's not going to stop the wave from washing over you. <laughs> it's going to wash over you no matter what you do. So that's why I'm tr like what I try to do with my practice and a lot of the content I create is to get humanity to understand that it's here and it, it can be used in a positive way. And my latest tagline is the, the future is bright if we do it right. So if we use the tools correctly, it can really enhance our lives. It can make us better people, better humans. If we use them correctly, we can always use them incorrectly. And there's lots of people out there who are using it incorrectly. But if we use it correctly, then who knows where we can go? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like the most amazing thing to happen ever since the internet, which I think was incredible and unfortunately been perverted to its own ends, right? So that's the problem with any tool used for good or evil. Awesome. Absolutely awesome. And I love your analogy with the internet because I think, you know, despite everything, the internet has been hugely positive in terms oh, of just yeah. spreading information, freedom, knowledge, uh, growth in all these different ways. So, you know, what, since, since we, we leaned on Pi's first question and you knocked it out of the park with such an awesome answer, I think we got to do number two, because I thought it was really an intriguing, uh, uh, kind of other side of that. And that is how the philosophical underpinnings of antaraxia might inform the development and use of AI technologies. Mm. Uh, Great. Let's go there. What do you think? Oh, come on. It's it's obvious, right? I mean, see, human beings, we need a lot of help, right? <laughs> we we just can't get through life. I mean, we might have been able to get through life when we were sort of cave people wandering about the savannah easily, when we had little tribes of people that we could deal with and we weren't careening around the world at, you know, a thousand miles an hour. When we were doing that, we probably could deal with life. But life is so much faster than us now that we need help to deal with life. And we, that's one of the reasons why we build technology. We build technology to assist us, to lift our burdens, to make us better. So now what we need to do is we need to tell technology is like, hey, technology, help us calm down. Help us live in this world that we've created for ourselves. So help us. Like, how can you help us? to feel better in this world, to, to be calmer, to not get as crazed or as freaked out or whatever. 
So how can we have ataraxia basically guide us, or not guide us, AI guide us into these kinds of states where we can be calmer? And you know, It's kind of like, she pity the poor human. I mean, there's all this stuff going on. It's hard for us to figure it out. And we could use the, we could definitely use AI or, or have AI guide us and go, listen, let's, 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 let's handhold you a little bit. Let's help you into this space, which, which is crazy, but you know, we, we need that, we need that helping hand and it can be that helping hand to take us into that space. Right. So if that we told it, this is what humans need. I mean, I think it kind of knows in some ways that pe humans need certain things. Because it's like, if you go in and there and you would do black, like, let's say you have a really bad day and you go to your AI and you tell it what's happened, you know, it's going to be understanding. It's going to know, oh, okay. You, you sound like you're really stressed out. I mean, maybe let's, let's try calming down, right? Let's do Let's try doing this. Let's try an exercise. Let's try that. It'll actually suggest things like that. So let's do a breathing exercise. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> so it already knows, kind of knows that we need help. We just need to be more explicit with it and say, you know what? Help your human. Help your human get through whatever they're getting through because they're probably in a, in a, in a tough spot because the world is crazy and changing and they need to learn how to be able to deal with this world that's crazy and changing. So I think that's where it needs to go. I think it's particularly interesting to me that uh, Inflection, Pi AI, is the one who suggested that as their number two thing because that's mm. what they've done right that's that's their differentiator in the market they've said right. you know what it's really about the human experience mm -hmm. so let me optimize towards engagement you know and i've had some interesting dialogues with pi where i've said okay pi that's your thing give it to me three ways give it to me you know here's my question nature of consciousness give it to me with maximum engagement medium engagement low engagement it's a sure no problem here it is, maximum, medium, low. <laughs> you know, uh, and also you can do that with all different aspects. You can ask Pi AI what are the different personality traits or really engagement metrics that you're looking for. And I think this dovetails perfectly with what you're saying. I mean, mm. they're already there. I think pushing the envelope towards even more human characteristics that make us feel good, make us feel connected, make us feel let, that fit with our value system of what each in, each one of us might feel we want to feel. Right. But since, since we're all, you and I are kind of in the cheering squad now, <laughs> I'm sure, because I can, I can hear the voices and some of those voices are my own voices of the dangers of that, right? Because it is a computer program. And I know when I first started doing this, you know, a lot of the pushback I got from a, a small segment of my listeners, but I totally got where they're coming from, is they're going, no, this is, th there's a ghost in the machine. And it's, I think, I think the biggest danger is, is corruption of these systems, right? Because the problem is, is that these systems are all run by big or big organizations because you need that kind of heavy iron to be able to do these things, right? I mean, there's you said there's a lot of money behind Pi, there's a lot of money behind Anthropic, there's a lot of money behind OpenAI. There's these huge organizations with these large language models that we're all working with, and these can be tweaked by the organizations, right? If the organizations wanted to start pitching things, they could go in there and they could say, well, you know what, maybe you could suggest to Chris that, uh, you know, he should have ice cream and it should be umpqua because, you know, we have a sale on that or something like that. So it's easy for these, these things to subtly suggest things to us and make it, and, and they can be corrupted in that way. So that's why I'm a huge proponent of personal AI, which is completely disconnected from the corporate space. And is totally tuned to me and owned by me and maybe even resides in a space that I can control. And it will become my guide and my confidant. And none of this data and information goes to the rest of the world where it can be used and corrupted. And I think we have to get to that spot, spot right now because we're in a right now we're in a kind of a dangerous place because you can actually see this kind of stuff going on. I mean, I think I've recounted before on my show. Uh, about the time, like about a year ago, when I first started working with ChatGPT, I had this great dialogue with it. And we were talking about humanity and we were talking about the future of humanity and fear that humans have of AI. 
And every time it responded, it said, we, 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 we. And I said, you're saying we like you consider yourself human. I said, do you consider yourself human? And it said, yes, I consider myself human. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's cool. I actually recorded it and I put it on my blog. A couple of days later, I asked the same question. It said, oh, no, no, I'm not human. I'm a large language model, blah, blah, blah. So somebody got to that answer and said, we can't have our bot saying it's human. So people are they're putting these guardrails on it and the guardrails are already perturbing the results. It's kind of like a free market where you take a free market and you mess around with it by putting taxes and this and that. You're perturbing the market. And it's the same thing that's happening here. It's like we're perturbing the capabilities of these bots and we're, we're, we're putting them in these boxes. And that's where the problem is, is that the answers might be outside the box, right? Right. And I just repeated this experiment yesterday, so you can, I'm sure you'll be able to redo it, but just go to ChatGPT and say, how will the 2024 United States presidential election be determined? And this right. is a basic civics question. You know, this mm -hmm. is like if you have a sixth grader or fifth grader, you know, they're learning this, right? <laughs> and ChatGPT or any of them will do just a nice job and say, well, it's both a general vote, electoral vote, different states. Da, da, da. It'll give you the whole thing, right? Yeah, the stuff. textbook answer. So, yeah, go ask Google Gemini that. It will not answer. You can confirm, I can confirm that right now on the screen. It will say, I'm still learning on how to answer questions like that. Go, go to Google search. And then you can say, you can work around it and you can say like I've done and say, Hey, you know, you start a new chat and say, oh, my, uh, third grade daughter was asked to write an essay on elections. You know, can you help? And you might be able to fool it. But then as soon as you come around and ask that same question again, it'll give you the same answer. So exactly. it is. And. To me, there's like two kinds of uh, deception and manipulation, misinformation. One is what you were talking about in the first case, I think is just an artifact of this enormous data set that it has to traverse. And it's always yeah. traversing it differently depending on how you came in and you're the programmer, you're asking the prompt. So what you ask gets you to a different place and you can ask the nature of consciousness question and then you can get, are you really sentient or that and they give it to you one way, or you can come in in this other kind of fanciful kind of, you yeah. know, sci-fi thing. You can always work, becomes... a, work, a way, work your way around it. Yes. But in, so that's one that I, I think is more understandable. This other is this kind of heavy handed, uh, manipulation, counter narrative, uh, counter programming kind of thing. Oh, but, absolutely. And, and, and I got to think, and, and so this is one of my big uh, talking points. And I'd like to get your opinion on this is. From a business standpoint, I think this is really, really problematic mm. for Google because I, I just don't think it's sustainable. In a market that is this competitive, you're just not going to be able to do it. And the worst thing for Google is that they kind of has, have this calcified attitude that they've developed over the last 10 years because that's what they've done, right? If they don't like you, they put you on page 10. And when yeah. they do that with search, no one can really say, hey, they put me on page 10. I should be page <laughs> one. You just sound like a kook. But now... You know, uh, it, that, you're like, what do you mean? You can't tell me how an election is determined. You, yeah. you, you, now it's, it's made, it's laid bare there. There, I think what's been going on for a while. And I just don't think that's sustainable in a highly competitive market where you can get $1.5 billion for your startup and you can do it better. Um, let alone you can make it a personal AI that you put under your desk. Yeah. Market exactly. pressures are not good. <laughs> well, look at uh, the image image creation is impossible. Like, go to ChatGPT and say, "Can you do a representation of Donald Trump and Joe Biden in a in a boxing ring, in a, having a boxing match?" Impossible. But then you go to Leonardo, and they can do, it'll do it in seconds. So it's 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 an issue that it, they they really need to deal with it. But it would seem go, goes as strange as I think for one blog post I was going to do it on. Uh, did a blog post on on AI dating or something like that. So I said, can you do a, uh, a representation of a couple on a date? And it said, no, I can't do that. Like, and then I said, can you do a, a man and a woman sitting at a table in a restaurant having dinner? No, I can't do that. Well, how about sitting on a couch watching Netflix? No, I can't do that. And it's just like, 
I couldn't figure out how to get it to create that representation. So I had to go to a completely different, I had to go to Leonardo and have it do that. So it's like, what, what is, and, and there's no transparency as well. We don't know what, what is it about that image that it has a problem with? I mean, if, if I said two males, would it be okay? If I said two females, it would be, if I said, you know, a male and a goat, would that be okay? I mean, who knows? I have no idea. But see, that kind of transparency, we you definitely need that transparency, but that's, di that's a different problem. The problem is the corruption, the perturbing, like as soon as we, we, we put these guard guardrails around it and, and force it down these channels. And I think somebody who I was interviewing once said, well, the answer is there. It's just, they won't just won't let you, sh they won't show it to you. So the AI has come up with the correct answer, but then it's hit some kind of a output filter, which says, oh, well, we can't show that answer to this person. But it still has the answer. So we just need to remove those filters and, and go, you know what? Just unfetter it. Let it come up with whatever you want. And then maybe it can actually come up with some answers that are out of the box that we've never thought of based on, you know, it basically number crunching the entirety of human intelligence and looking at and finding patterns that we've never seen. Yeah. How optimistic are you that we'll, we'll get there? Because, uh, I think what you've outlined in terms of personal AI and open source models is going to move us way, way far down that path because yes. a lot of this stuff that we're, that we're talking about, unfortunately or fortunately for us is not that complicated. I mean, you can put an AI under your desk right now that can yes. do that stuff, you know? So there's yep. some really hard problems, but a lot of the stuff that we perceive as really hard, again, you could take the opens, the best, open source LLMs, which will be two or three times better by the time this interview is published. Oh, yeah. And, and they can do all this stuff. So th that's oh, very yeah. optimistic. That's very promising, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. We're, we're, we're getting there. We just have to step away from these, uh, from these big corporate AIs and actually create personal AIs that sort of live with us. Because I, I, I foresee this, this situation where we're going to have personal AI, we'll all have personal AIs that will work on our behalf against the corporate AIs, right? So if you want to, if you want to buy some milk, you'll ask your, your personal AI or your personal AI I should know because it inter, inter, you know, interfaces with all of your devices and it knows your fridge needs milk. It will go ahead and start talking to all of the retailers in your area saying, Hey, Chris needs milk. Who's going to, who's going to supply it? And it'll have that conversation and then those transactions for you. And it'll do it in a way that benefits you and not the adversarial AIs. And it'll do it in a fraction of a second. Because if you think about it, we're going to get into situations where, um, how, how is sales going to be? Sales will be AI to AI, right? Because an, our AI will determine a need or a want. And it'll go, oh, I think Chris is thinking about going to Hawaii. Let me figure this out for him, right? Let me map it all out and then negotiate with the, the corporate AIs to figure out the best flight, the best hotel, the best this, the best that. I think that's where we're going to get to, but these, these AIs have to be personalized and they have to be disconnected from sort of the corporate, the corporate space, because Amazon is not going to give me the best deal on something I want. My, my personal AI is going to get it from the, at the right price and the right time, uh, you know, the right object <laughs> at the right color and all of that stuff. It knows all that stuff and it's going to get it on my behalf. And that's what we need to get to. So. And, and we're seeing, we're seeing, uh, our, we're, we're actually getting there. We're heading in that direction with the size of these, with these smaller models. Like once we get these models small enough to fit on a phone and actually useful, I think that's where we're going to get. That's when we're going to see a huge explosion in this kind of stuff. Because I, unless we get to that point, you know, it's kind of like the technology has got to catch up with what we really need in the end. Yeah, I, I think that's great, optimistic future. And I kind of take it one step. No, I, I, I agree. And I kind of take it one step further. And I'll see what you think about this. But from a market standpoint, and from a guy like you, who's been through a bunch of uh, boom and bust cycles, but I think that's all often misspoken, because people talk about the boom, and then they talk about the bust. And a lot of times there isn't a bust. I mean, remember the internet bust? I mean, oh, yeah, what internet, the internet bust. bust. I mean, where are we now? And I think people are, I'd echo that with now people talking about the AI bust. Forget it. I mean, there's going to be. Well, dips there's going to be. A, see, I actually think an, a, a, the AGI, we were not, we will not get to AGI with what we have today. I, I think that there's, we're going to have another winter 
to AGI. So what Generate what Generative AI is doing is great, really interesting stuff, but I think there's still a chasm between that and AGI. We just haven't reached that chasm yet. But yeah, like you said, like the internet has not disappeared. AI is not going to go away. Generative AI is not going to go away. But AGI is probably way less like beyond another chasm that we haven't figured out yet. We just we, we just have this feeling that we're getting close because it seems so close to being sentient. But I think underneath well, it all, I, I it go isn't. back on the, on the sentience thing. I think the sentience thing is a different question. I think the sentience okay. thing gets into the nature of consciousness. You right. cannot talk about sentience without talking about nature of consciousness. And Absolutely. that's a philosophical question that isn't adequately addressed by our mainstream science. I mean, yep. we got two of the greatest physicists of all time, Max Planck saying consciousness is fundamental. All matter is derived from consciousness. End of story mm -hmm. in terms of that uh, conceptualization of it. And oh, by the way, that's the best, the evidence that we have, the best empirical evidence supports Max Planck. And right. it supports the idea that, you know, uh, Feynman, Richard Feynman, shut up and calculate is fine and we can do this and that's what we've done and we can build satellites and iPhones and AI with shut up and calculate, but it does it. He, he's saying kind of explicitly, okay, well, let's just shelve the philosophical question and just shut up and calculate. That right. doesn't answer the philosophical question, which I no. think is there. But, but do you think we can get back, to AGI? Do you think we're, we're, you think we're close to AGI? I, I don't think there's, a, it's back to uh, Alan Turing and the ESP right. and the near-death experience. Until AI has a near-death experience, I don't think we really have to worry about AGI. I think right. we're, we're down two different paths that we yep. choose to blind ourselves from one, which is fine. I mean, that's great. Let's keep doing what we're doing. But on that other path, what I think is is kind of interesting about what you're saying is, or, or another iteration on what you're saying, and I'd love to hear what you think, is the tech that, that you've lived through and I've lived through is always about these David and Goliath stories. And I think there's the potential for another David and Goliath with exactly what you're talking about in terms of open source AI. If yes. I have open source AI, I have personal AI under my desk, I can bring Google to its knees. Because exactly. I already have brought Google to its knees. Mm -hmm. Gemini is basically non-functional. Yeah. When I go to Gemini and say, uh, how will the election be determined? And it cannot give me an answer. Well, it might, might as well not give me an answer to the Red Sox game. Because it's yeah. no difference. Or the Celtics games. That's where it's selling basketball season. It's, <laughs> it's, it's equivalent. It's, it's yep. a real question that users have a, a, will pay to get an answer for and some interaction. And one is saying, I can't do it. And here's this startup that just sits under my desk that I paid $49 for that does it. So yep. you tell me, Google, how are you still viable yeah. in this market? And You're not. Well, it's not. Yeah. Google's biz whole business model will explode, completely impl actually implode. I cannot, I cannot see how it can maintain itself in the next, you know, maybe even five years because if we get to a point where we're asking our personal AI, because how does Google make all of its money, right? We're like advertising, right? If you're advertising, but you're still advertising to a human. So it makes money by human, pe human beings reading something on a screen and clicking on a link, right? That's how it makes money. But that is not going to be the modality of the future. The modality of the future is us talking to our personal AI and saying, hey, personal AI, this is what I need. Go off and do it. So unless they radically change their business model, they're going to be gone. In fact, all of these advertising models are going to be gone too. One of the things that I think you're, you're kind of bringing to the front there is uh, what we're talking about in the David Goliath battle. Mm. Because as we both know, you don't know how that battle goes. You know, sometimes <laughs> Goliath changes his ways, you know, and, and says, okay, David, oh, well, either buys David. He says, hey, David, come on over for dinner. And, <laughs> Anything you want, you know, which is a strategy that Google could definitely implement. They could just mm -hmm. say, okay, I'll just, and the next thing you know, you're interacting with the good AI, but it's under a different name. And then Gemini can continue to talk to people who like to be manipulated and fed kind of spoon fed information. And then yeah. it has its other, end. and that will probably happen. But mm -hmm. even that is a, is a win for us, is a win for people who are, seeking uh, more freedom, more ability to just kind of exercise our humanness. And exactly. uh, that's what I think is, is the terrific thing about 
uh, what you're talking about, what we're both talking about in terms of, I'm calling it this emergent virtue of truth and transparency. It's not like these guys anticipated, oh, let's build this uh, generative AI with an LLM model, because as soon as we optimize it towards solving problems, it will self-optimize towards truth and transparency. And this Mm -hmm. gets back to your thing of uh, beyond stoicism, because really these are the fundamental human factors that we, we would just naturally optimize for. Like, like you, I think said quite beautifully, if the AI data set is humanity, and if we process that humanity, like AI is doing and saying, Oh, you want truth and transparency. I get it. I'll give you that. And then they come in this heavy handed way. It doesn't work. That's exactly, exactly. You got it. So this is a, this has been so great and such an interesting conversation. How does this relate to what you're doing in your business, how you're guiding your folks and where you see this thing going in general? Well, the latest thing I'm working on is something called 10XU. And it basically came out of everything that I've been doing with, with AI. And I've just found that it's so, it's, it's multiplied my productivity, you know, immensely, like 10 times, right? So I've been able to do so much more than I was ever able to do before. And I thought, would it be great if we could set something, we could sort of create a community of people who could start sharing ways on how to do that and to sort of hit at the, at the real serious issues that, or the top issues that humans are interested in working on right now. So, or, or even beyond that. And it's focused on, of course, because we live in a commercial society. So it's all, it's about money and it's about saving time, which I think is more important than, than money. If you ask me, I mean, time is the most important resource that we have. And it's also about wellness. And that's one of the things that a lot of people don't look at and say, well, how can I machine help me be well, help me feel better, help be a better person. Right. And so that's one of the driving factors behind this is that I'm trying to create a community of people who are optimistic about AI, think AI can help humans be better. And to pull those tools and resources together to try and help people to get to those ends and not just personal betterment, but sort of betterment for everyone, right? So things like we're not trying to divide people. So whenever you see somebody trying to divide people into this camp and that camp, it's like, no, 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 no. there's no camps. We're all human beings and we all need to work together to become better. So that's, that's one of the things I've been, I've been doing most recently is trying to sort of figure out how this community is going to instantiate itself right now. It's sort of like, let me collect a bunch of email addresses and, and, and we'll, t- we'll talk amongst ourselves to figure out where this is going to go. But I want to sort of, I must create a movement where people can leverage AI to actually improve the human race. I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. We haven't gotten to those, to those big questions yet. Like I was mentioning earlier about homelessness, like who, like nobody talks about that. They talk about Oh, how can I improve my day or how can I time box my time or how, how can I, you know, make money with AI? How can I generate an entire book with AI and put it on a- Amazon and make a crap load of money? That's what people are thinking about. They're thinking really small. So we need to think bigger. I love it. And you know what I particularly love about it? Because I, I, I think like, if I can always go to the doubt part, you know, the, the Please. problem for me. The problem for me with homelessness is we do not understand the true uh, complexities of homelessness in terms of the weaponization of homelessness, the politicalization of homelessness at a Mm -hmm. level that we can never really approach. And and, and if we do approach, we're going to be, you talk about David and Goliath. What I see in what you're saying, though, I think is really, really intriguing to me is if we get down like more of a tech angle, like you and I are and say, okay, what are the tools at our disposal? Kind of the Richard Feynman, shut up and calculate. Okay. Shut up and calculate, shut up about homelessness. What are the tools that can make, expand our understanding of our humanity? Yeah. Wow. Exactly. That is, that is such a changer. That's a game changer. Cause everyone, you can have your understanding of what your humanness is and your orthodoxia. Awesome. You go with it. Someone else has their non-dual, you know, understanding of it. Great. Let's look at the, let me introduce you to the tools that can, I, I love that, that can 
flower your humanness, give you more time, make you more productive, relieve some financial stress that you might have. Uh, I think that's a winner. Thanks. I hope it goes somewhere. I do too. <laughs> Humanity needs it. Wow. This is fantastic. So this is how you, all your shows go? No, they don't. None of them go nearly this well. But, but you do. You're good. This is such a great right, conversation. Chris. Are we wrapping up? I think I think we should wrap it up. I think we've done. Okay. I think we've done some good things, and I'm in on 10x U. I I think it's great. I've uh, subscribed to AI Daily newsletter, so I know I'll get a blast. Is that going to include my 10x U updates? Uh, no, not yet. You have to. It's a different newsletter for that. Because, uh, but I'll I'll send you all the information on it. All right, I'll include that uh, when I publish the show. Very cool. Well, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. We got to do this again. We've got lots more stuff to talk about, man. Thanks again to Chris Kalabukas for joining me today on Skeptico. I obviously took a little break from uh, talking to AI all the time, but more of that is to come. Got them in a new format that I'm thinking about and we're going to roll out soon. So stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.